There are a lot of great songs about short-legged dogs out there. Well, okay, so this is where the thing starts going awry. rock. Oh my God, they have a word for that? Frozen monkey balls. Because you could get the male fish excited. It all comes back to the black and white cookie. We are moving and we're not telling you where. I remove umbilicals. This goes into the category of how could you possibly think that's the lyric, Kurt? Put the key in the metaphorical podcast engine. Ooh, so we're starting. We're starting, Kurt. All right, so we're going to rev up this engine and we're going to start a new episode of Smart Drivel, the definitive podcast of... Exactly. Dribble? You know why I know this is going to be a great podcast, Kurt? Poor because Paul. when you were plugging in your microphone a moment ago, you put the USB in correctly the first time, which how often does that happen, Kurt? Never happens. You realize that there's a 50-50 shot of getting it right and it never happens to you? Have you considered just going against your instinct each and every time? It's like, I don't think I've ever made it through one piece of dental floss as a whole without it sort of cutting up or going too oh, small. Oh, one. I have that problem too. One tooth always cuts it. Do you yeah. use Glide? Never. My dentist hates Glide, says it's, it's like the devil's. Oh, for God's sake. Glide is great. And not, not you've heard the expression, idea. God is great. This is Glide is great, which means something completely different. Kurt, we're going to dedicate, I'm going to dedicate my part of this podcast, at least, to my next door neighbor in elementary school. Her name is Susie Cameron. And back when we were kids, Barry Manilow was kind of a big deal. And he had that very popular song, Looks Like We Made It. You want to hum a few bars? Looks like we made it. And I don't like Barry Manilow. Despite the fact that the song was called Looks Like We Made It, my friend, who remains a friend to this day, Susie, believed that Barry Manilow was saying, looks like tomatoes, which is ridiculous, makes no sense. But that what she was convinced of it, Kurt. Does she like tomatoes? You know, I don't recall her, her relationship to tomatoes or for that matter, any pieces of fruit. However, tomatoes as fruit. Good, John. Nice, subtle. Well done. Thank you. That was completely accidental. I'm still basking in the afterglow of you getting the USB and right the first time. So we're going to have an entire discussion, Kurt, about commonly misunderstood song lyrics. And I think they fall into two buckets, Kurt. Bucket number one is, you know what? I think the singer might actually be saying that. And it kind of makes sense in the song. And then there's the much larger bucket, Kurt, where what the people think they're hearing in the context of the song and the song title could not make less sense, Kurt. And as you said, there are the title sometimes gives it away and people still screw it up. It is amazing. So why don't we, any podcast, any content that is dedicated to or even slightly alludes to lyrics that are screwed up must start with this song. Please. It was written by Bruce Springsteen. Made famous by Manfred Mann. Ah. And to this day, even I, well, until about an hour ago, did not know what the lyrics were. We always thought in the song Blinded by the Light that the lyrics were wrapped up like a douche, another rumor in a man or something like that. And we kept, all kept saying, why is there a douche in a song? Why is he one to wrap up like a douche, which is not even physically possible anyway? Have you tried? No, because I don't have a bidet. We've talked about this in a previous podcast. You seem like the kind of person, given your frequent Europe re references to Europe, that would have a bidet in his home. I, I think there's a benefit to it, but I don't have it. So the real lyrics are revved up like a deuce, another rumor in the night. A deuce being a car, a hot rod, rem, 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 rem. revved up like a deuce, another rumor in the night. Boom. Do you think that's why we kicked off with a car engine metaphor, or is that just good fortune, Kurt? I think it was subconscious. Uh, so I, too, was confused by this lyric growing up, and I actually had a different problem with it. I didn't hear 
just douche. I thought he was saying wrapped up like a douchin. And as you probably are wondering, what the heck is a douchin? And that's what I was like, wrapped up like a douchin, something in the night. What is a douchin? So I had made up a completely nonsensical word that I guess I just didn't understand. I thought it was just an affected way to pronounce dachshund. Uh, yes, because there are a lot of great songs about short-legged dogs out there. Exactly. There are songs about fat bottom girls, but not short-legged dogs. I, of course, refer to ah. Queen. Yes. So I'll give you one to kick us off that is by an artist that I think you and I both enjoy. In fact, you called his song Levon his very best in a recent episode. And I'm, I'm of course, referring to Elton John. He has a misunderstood, he's got several misunderstood lyrics, but this one in particular probably takes the cake. The song Tiny Dancer, the correct lyric, of course, is hold me closer, tiny dancer. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, there are more than a handful of people, Kurt, that believe Elton John is singing, hold me closer, Tony Danza. Yeah, well, he was a stud in the 70s. And this is actually a thing. Um, despite the fact that the song was a three-time platinum winner, therefore incredibly popular, you think people would understand the words. It was actually a joke. I don't know if you remember this episode of Friends when some of the characters were discussing the most romantic songs of all time. And Phoebe says, in her opinion, it's the one that Elton John wrote for that guy on Who's the Boss? Hold me closer, Tony Danza. Well, Elton John's a famous gay person so he might maybe that's what made people think about it, that he would really was a love letter to tony danza even though written by bernie topin i was gonna say bernie Perrant, but wasn't he the goalie for the philadelphia flyers yes in the, when they were the broad street bullies in yes the he was their goaltender i'm going to tell you a story and it it pokes fun at me at no one else for excuse me that is my job for exactly right for totally blowing this or allowing a friend in his bombastic confidence way of speaking to bully me into believing this were true. You were bombastically bullied? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Beleagueredly so. Oh, I'm bummed to hear that. And then I went into bereavement about it. You know what makes you feel better? A burrito. Yes. <laughs> so there's a song by the Grateful Dead. And this is a guy who used to travel to see the Grateful Dead. Drive in that train. He took huge pride in being a deadhead. And there's a song, Uncle John's Band, which we all love. Yep. So in that song, by the way, in uh, Tiny Dancer, there's a great line written about the woman. She's got a pirate smile. And that scene is a positive. I love that. Arr, pirate smile. Maybe I'm getting it wrong. Maybe it's something else. Does he then say, R? <laughs> no, that would be on September 19th when it's national international talk like a pirate day. R. So, by the way, I saw Dodgeball for the first time the other day, and there's a guy in there who thinks he's a pirate. I'm a little surprised it's taking you this long to see that. I don't recall it being a great movie. Nope. Ben Stiller, right? Yep. A whole movie on Dodgeball. How about yeah. that? I love this country. I used to love Dodgeball. So, Uncle John's band... This guy convinced me that the line in it is, there was a milt of cannonballs. Their motto is, don't tread on me. A milt? Yeah. And I kept saying to him, no, it's their walls are built of cannonballs. Their motto is... What was Before you tell us which one is correct, of course, the word built is a word that many people are familiar with. The word milt, other than my uncle milt, and he was probably not the subject of a Grateful Dead song. What's a milt? Well, okay, so this is where the thing starts going awry. So my friend or colleague, Grant, tells me, a milt, you know, a milt of cannonballs is when they have that pyramid and they're each put in and at, by every cannon, there's this pyramid of balls. That's a milt of cannonballs. Now, this was before the Google was invented and I was too lazy to go to a dictionary. So I took him at face value. And I, for years, I would correct people. It's not their walls are built of cannonballs. It's there's a milt of cannonballs, you know, the pyramid. And you John, enjoy correcting people, don't you? John, do you know what a milt is? As I looked up just the other day for the first time ever. I have no earthly idea what a milt is. Semen of male fish. 
Oh my God. They have a word for that? Yes. And he could not have been more wrong. And I would sit there for years. It's a milk of cannonballs. First of all, he was wrong. Second of all, he made up that the milk was the pyramid when milk is semen of male fish. I'm still stuck on there's a word for that. Yeah. There's a word so for everything. Back to what well, thank you for that. Back to one of our earliest podcasts, Kurt, when we were talking about the origin of great expressions. I told you the plate. That the step that the pyramid of cannonballs sits on with little indentations to avoid the cannonballs rolling all over the ship deck. Frozen monkey balls. Frozen monkey balls is not correct, but it's certainly close enough. The expression freeze the balls off a brass monkey. That plate is called a brass monkey, and it was made of brass so that when it got really cold, the iron of the balls would not fuse together with the with the brass of the monkey. When they first made the plates, they were iron, the same material as the cannonballs, and they would all corrode together. So they had to make the monkey out of brass, and you don't want to freeze the balls off a brass monkey because you could get the male fish excited. Doesn't that make, and then you get milked, does that not make metaphorical sense to relationships in general? That if you're two alike, it doesn't work. You should have opposites attract. It all comes back to the slightly melted black and white cookie. Oh, God, do I love those cookies. Do you eat them one half at a time? Or do you take like a bite of the chocolate vanilla part to begin with? I've done both. But I usually go all the way white and all the way black. Or you know what? I go all the way white as well. So you and I are alike. Yet this podcast works in our opinion. But I was going to say slightly melted because a slightly melted black and white cookie is what exactly the symbol for yin and yang i never really thought of the cookie needed to melt a bit to pull that off but otherwise yin and yang the whole beauty about it is it's it's sort of amorphous it it fits in it's not a straight line and and a good all right you you've convinced me i'm not dedicating this episode to susie cameron i'm dedicating it to the New York icon, the black and white cookie, preferably slightly melted. You know what was really cool about New York? Remember when we were young, there was no Starbucks and you drank coffee out of Me and Susie had so much fun. I can't believe you said that because now I have to dedicate the episode again to Susie Cameron. Remember when Rock was young, me and Susie had so much fun. It's the yin and yang of this of this episode. But we used to drink coffee out of those if they were to go which didn't happen as we talked about in the rest of like in Europe, but we had to go because they were always that diner, fake Greek writing columns. I love that. That is truly really iconic New York. That's great. I've seen people that have porcelain mugs with that design on it. That's pretty cool. I would like to discuss the proboscis because a couple of episodes ago, we were talking about Cyrano de Bergerac. Yes. Large and proboscis. Large proboscis. And up came the discussion of Charles de Gaulle, who also yeah. had a, also had a what, Kurt? A very large proboscis. Thank you. In fact, he had a nickname that was based on his proboscis, which I remember. And what was his nickname? The great broccoli, the great broccoli Rob, the great zucchini. No. Good the enough. The great asparagus. That is correct. We asked each other that question on the episode. What was his nickname? And neither one of us could remember, which is why I'm going to reference this mind boggling, misunderstood lyric from the fifth dimension. I'm referring, of course, to Aquarius, let the sun shine in, which is a true hippie anthem. And it's actually a mashup back before mashups were called mashups of two songs that were from the musical Hair. In addition to it being a mashup, there's something else that's unusual about the song, even before we get to the misunderstood lyric, and that it was actually recorded by the, by the Fifth Dimension in two different cities, both Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Wait, Name me another song that's been recorded in more than one city. One song, two cities. So it was done in the third dimension by the Fifth Dimension? Whoa! Yes, two different cities, not different dimensions. It reminds me of a baseball player named Joel Youngblood, who played for the Mets. And he had a hit in a game in Chicago at Wrigley Field in the afternoon against the Cubs, was traded after the game to the Phillies. 
actually made it to Philadelphia in time for that evening's game and had a hit in that game too. So he had two hits for different teams in different cities on the same day, which if you squint is kind of analogous to what I'm talking about. It was sad that he got treated. The correct lyric is, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. You want to give us a a soundbite? This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, the age of Aquarius. Shockingly to my ears, I don't think we introduced ourselves. I'm John Ellenthal, your co-host of Smart Drivel. And who are you? Kurt Schneider. My fellow co-host of Kurt of, of, of Smart Drivel. I don't think we introduced ourselves at the beginning of the episode. So we're going to do it right smack in the middle. There are people who believe that they are singing, this is the dawning of the age of asparagus. And unless they are great Parisian or Charles de Gaulle fans, that makes no stinking sense whatsoever, Kurt. You should say that because maybe they were doing it to see how their urine smelled. Did you hear how I said makes no stinking sense? I got it. I liked it. I only wish I said that on purpose because I might be mildly impressed by myself. However, I did not say that on purpose. So kudos to you for noticing. Subconscious. Subconscious. I know it's your turn, but I'd like to stick with noses, and then I will turn the I microphone just, over to you. I'd like to say one thing about hair. Please. The year was 1971. I was living in Tokyo, and my parents went out one day, and they said to my brother and me, you can- We are play- moving, and we're not telling you where. <laughs> no. You can play music, but you may not play that album, Hair. Why? Well, when you're six and eight years old, you want to know why it's the forbidden fruit. So, of course, we played it because there's a song about fellatio in that and sodomy. Like we would know what that meant anyway. I thought they were saying Horatio. No. (laughs) A misunderstood lyric. So you and I, and I'm sure our listeners, know the song by the police, Message in a Bottle, really well. Epic hit. Certainly one of their most popular songs ever. And this, is, this goes into the category of how could you possibly think that's the lyric, Kurt? The correct lyric, of course, is, let me, before I do this, when you put a message in a bottle, what do you write to put in the bottle? A note. Correct. And since I referenced this was a continuation of the proboscis theme, you might be thinking, nose in a bottle. People believe a year has passed since I broke my nose. So this is message in a bottle. A year has passed since I broke my nose. Even if you thought you were hearing that, are you not curious enough to know that, to find out why he was talking about breaking his nose while he was sending out a message in a bottle? No, I get it. Because guess what? What if she saw him before he broke his nose and he's so worried and traumatized about the disfiguration of his face because said proboscis was broken that he's worried about. That's been a year since I broke this thing. Are you still going to like me and see me? Are we going to be okay here? I get that completely. You know, that argument is so good, Kurt, that I'm going to withdraw my fake outrage. A hundred million bottles washed up on that shore. Yeah. So where do they all come from? People's noses. So a lot of people, and how did they split between she's still going to like you or he's still going to like you and not like you? Well, it's probably about the same thing of trying to put the UBS thing in correctly. Well, UBS could be the first mistake you're making when you try to connect it. (laughs) Yes. You can call the bank and they might be able to help you. But my experience with bank customer service suggests that may not be your best first move, Kurt. So along those lines of ridiculousness. Are we leaving the nose portion of our episode, Kurt? We are. But along those lines of ridiculousness. There's a great song by Hot Chocolate. Ooh, called, Hot Chocolate. Called You Sexy Thang. And there's a line in it because this guy can't believe that this woman is actually now his girlfriend. And the line is, I believe in miracles. Yes. Right? Because he got her to be his girlfriend. And clearly it was a miracle required for that to happen. There are thousands, nay, Hundreds of that, well, a lot of people who think that it's not that he believes in miracles, but it, what he does instead, and the reason why she likes him is, I remove umbilicals. Oh, my God. Are there more people who believe that's the lyric or bottles that washed up on shore in Message in a Bottle? I remove umbilicals. Ah, 
Have you listened to that lyric recently and tried to understand how you could possibly conclude that's what they're saying? No. I think what it was, if you think about it, in their logic. There's logic involved in this? I suspect not. This, they end up dating. They end up getting married. They end up having a child together. That's what he wants. He's so excited. And he was removing the umbilical. I have another entry following your strong entry in the how could that possibly be category. I will take you to Madonna like a virgin. So like a virgin was actually Madonna's first number one hit in the U.S. And believe it or not, using today's standards, the lyrics were so racy that it was hard for her to find a recording studio and a production team that would make the song. Um, because she said words like virgin. When you consider some of the lyrics I heard being blared out of the car in front of me today, this is rather tame. But like a virgin. So virgin is sort of the first time, right? Which is why she sings yeah. like a virgin touched for the very first time. Give it to me, Kurt. Like a virgin touched for the very first time. So first time virgin sort of works together. There's a bit of a there's a congruity going on there, Kurt. Well, if you think about the broad sense definition of the word virgin, it's not even sexual, right? You can have virgin lemonade, virgin olive oil, things that but are it's not about the touch. first time in all cases, right? Exactly. So like a virgin touched for the very first time makes sense. There is a large population of people who not only hear umbilicals, but like a virgin touched for the 31st time. <laughs> now, maybe they define virginity differently. Maybe this involves male fish, but touch for the 31st time. May, uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, Go Madonna. Staying with that is considered the greatest. Who's considered, John, the greatest guitarist of all time? Jeff Beck. Close. Who's considered the greatest guitarist of all time? Jimi Hendrix. Correct. Who died when he was 27, like all those others. What do they call the 27 Club? I think it's called the 27 Club. <laughs> you know that I was told that Jimi Hendrix would make small cuts in his forehead, and then he would take his bandana and put LSD in it. Ooh. So when he started sweating, it would, it would sort of instigate the LSD, which would get into his skin via these small cuts. Wow. Are you going to tell us more about Purple Haze? Oh, yes. So Purple Haze, there is a song which is, excuse me while I kiss the sky. Right. Dur, dur, dur. Many people think it is, excuse me while I kiss this guy. Uh, you know who? I know one of those many people. My sister-in-law, Sharon, grew up, at least according to my wife, thinking he was saying, excuse me while I kiss this guy. And Hendrix made no effort to clarify. In fact, even sung the wrong lyrics in concerts sometimes and would point to some guy in the audience when they said, kiss this guy. So he actually sang the incorrect lyrics. I am very happy that you mentioned LSD in your Purple Haze because that gives us one of them segue things yes. that happens sometimes. Uh-huh. It just flows. Or it did until you said that. <laughs> and yes, if I had not gone as far as all that, it would have flowed beautifully. So consider this a missed opportunity. So the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. LSD, baby. 1967. It was actually banned by the BBC when it came out because it contained too many drug references. Sure. Something that the band actually denied for many years against, I don't know, obvious evidence to the contrary. They probably sold more records by denying it. Well, let me see for myself. I must buy it. Perhaps that's it. Yep. So Paul McCartney, apparently in an interview with the Daily Mail in 2004, finally fessed up that it was pretty obvious the song was about drugs. Yeah. In any event, this refers to Jimi Hendrix with LSD and obliquely to the umbilical cord removal lady. The lyrics, of course, of which are beautiful lyrics, the girl with kaleidoscope eyes, that is a beautiful turn of phrase. I mean, I don't think anyone ever described eyes with the adjective kaleidoscope before. Despite that, 
I think if you're on acid, maybe everyone's <laughs> eyes do look that, that way. That's a good point. This song may have been written while they're on acid. So uh -huh. the girl with kaleidoscope eyes, which is pretty darn clear to me, is actually misheard as the girl with colitis goes by. So it might be a song about drugs you take to lessen the symptoms of Crohn's disease. Could be. You know what? They're worried about poor people that have colitis. It maybe is like the March of Dimes in a song. You know what? Art is very much in the eyes and ears of the beholder. So maybe this really was outreach to those who had irritable bowel syndrome. So we need to wrap this episode up. What we're going to do by wrapping it up is just without giving the background, just say a couple of the most inane ones we've heard. So things like instead of I can see clearly now, the rain is gone. <laughs> I can see clearly now Lorraine is gone. Why? I'd like you to sing that for me, please. I can see clearly now Lorraine is gone. My wife, Suzanne, is a true animal lover, and she's an animal rights defender. So I will ask her forgiveness when I share this one, but it cracks me up too much not to share it. Eddie Money didn't have a lot of really famous songs, but he did have. One big hit. Yeah. Of course, it's I've Got Two Tickets to Paradise. Yes. Play that for us, Kurt. I've got two tickets to paradise. And this one has been rattling around in my head, this misheard lyric, all week since we began discussing this topic. And the fact that people could actually hear this is amazing. There are people who miss here, I've got two tickets to paradise, says, I've got two chickens to paralyze. <laughs> what? <laughs> I've got, why don't you sing that for us, Kurt? What, wait, say what you said. Again. I've got two chickens to paralyze. To paralyze? Yes. Like to render immobile? I'm believing yes. Two chick. why are you paralyzing a chicken? Because would you sing it so I can see if it makes any I've sense? I've got two chickens to paralyze. I get it. You just gotta love people. I think we're going to wrap up this episode on that because there before any more chickens get hurt, there ain't any other misconstrued lyric that could top. I've got two chickens to paralyze. Uh, it's just amazing what people think they hear. And all of these are heard by lots of people, as you pointed out. So these are not one offs. In any event, Kurt and I will be back next week with yes. a brand new episode of Smart Drivel, where we promise the drivel and hope for the smart. Until then, we hope your week and your life is filled with smart dribble. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.